participate in this uh, brown bag lecture series of the Institute of Sociological Research. It's the first time. And, uh, and also uh, to do this together with the Department of uh, Asian Studies, there's a long history of collaboration between us. There's even a longer history uh, between uh, Asian Studies and uh, social sciences or sociology. I, I thought I should say maybe uh, a few sentences about uh, the, the history or the broad differences between these two disciplines. So uh, today, if you go in the Department of East uh, Asian Studies, uh, even if it's more broader than it is in Geneva, usually uh, most of these scholars are very skilled with language and, and maybe culture, in the cultural world meaning they know very well those areas and they can communicate very uh, directly with the local people. And this is considered as crucial, very central to the scientific activity because you are able to let the people be themselves because they can speak their own language they can just do whatever they want and you are able to understand at least some of it. Where, uh, but usually uh, this kind of scholarship is quite weak in terms of methodology or theory. It's safe to say, I think I, I dare to say there is no real theoretical framework whatsoever in the study. Really, that's not the focus traditionally. And on the, in the sociology, it's, it's somehow the opposite. There is a, a clear strength with the theory, methodology. Uh, people are expected to have these skills to use them in presentation. But then sometimes if you discuss a specific uh, uh, area in the world, Usually, you don't have the same level of language and understanding as Asian scholars. And this comes, usually, historians of science speak in terms of traditions. So it comes from on the Asian studies side, it, it goes back to the uh, Jesuit missionaries who were looking at, uh, for instance, Confucius texts in, in China in the 16th century. And this ended up today where you're still looking at texts in Chinese. Of course, now. We look at many other things, but there's this tradition where in sociology you would go back to maybe Auguste Comte or Karl Marx at some point, and it's it's more like science as something more universal. At least there's a looking in that direction. So today we are very happy to work on Danama. Danama uh, came to our university with an ERC project of Professor Bruno Strasser in history of science. Then while she was here, she also started her own project. Today she's a senior researcher. She's met assistant, which is close to assistant professor in the US. You always difficult to translate. She's a specialist of uh, biomedical knowledge, health technologies. Um, we were expecting Catherine Kendi from the Michigan State University. Unfortunately, she cannot join us as a discuss discussant. So we will run, we have the good news actually, we have more <laughs> for our own discussion. So Dana, um, the screen, the floor is yours. Um, for people who are listening to us online, so if you are on YouTube, you will have normally only the presentation, then it, it will cut. If you want to be in the discussion, you have to go on Zoom. Zoom will be connected all the time, but most probably you will not be able, able to move the camera all the time. So, so uh, uh, sorry for the inconvenience. That's it, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you all for the invitation and uh, thank you uh, virtual listeners and watchers for partaking. So it's an honor for me to be here today and share a little part of my work with you. Um, as um, Basile already said, I'm coming from the direction of the, um, of the social studies of science. So I'm part of two or even three worlds. So, I can do hard sociology, but I can also do more like the hermeneutical approaches of the history of science, and the, the, the more explorative approaches of the Asia studies. So this particularly is a case study that I present today, and it's on uh, it's it's based on, on observations and on uh, close encounters with material, and you will see it is. Uh, it is more presented in a kind of uh, STS style. And uh, parts of it are developed together with Bruno Strasser in the past, especially when it comes to 
the epistemic value of experiential knowledge and other parts are some is a K or R case studies that I put together to shed more light on this uh, concept. So by the 19th century, with the professionalization of science, the credibility of knowledge claims came to be tied to the professional expertise of the scientist and to the institutions where he or more rarely she worked. How then, this was a question we asked in the ESC project in the 21st century, did the discourse emerge granting lay people, amateurs or citizen scientists, credibility in the co-production of scientific knowledge? We identified three narratives that have tried to explain the historical origins of current participatory research. The first looks back at the contributions of amateur naturalists in the 19th century. The second at radical scientists' movements in the 1960s and 1970s. And the third at the personal computer revolution of the 1990s. In this talk, I suggest a different narrative focused on the rise of experiential knowledge. In current participatory research, the challenges to the monopoly of expert knowledge, experimental and or clinical, rest in part on the claim that lay people's experience of their own bodies and environments can be a reliable source of scientific knowledge. The ability of lay people to identify changes in their own bodies, like in the patient data sharing network patients like me, you see it on the slide, rests on intimate bodily knowledge. The same counts for community-based environmental monitoring. And even to recognize subtle patterns in images of galaxies like with galaxy zoom, or to fold proteins online in three dimensions, like in the citizen science project Folded, also rests on such science by intuition as an editorialist of the journal Science recently stated. We wrote in one of our papers, it is not reason at work, but bodily perception, not objective facts, but subjective sensations. Not experiment, but experience. Yet, it is not only in the global north that such new ways of experience based participatory science are being developed or tested. Although the epistemic elements of imperialism still persist in many societies of the global south. Today, alternative forms of knowledge have never completely disappeared there. Popular examples of this tenacity of existence are the survival of traditional medicine in China or Ayurveda in large parts of India. However, even outside of medical practice, more and more people in these cultures begin to recall lost epistemic traditions that are independent of and or complementary to European or American influences. Paradigmatic for this is the project Nyangwai Thai Ban in Thailand. This Thai village research cannot be reduced in my eyes to participatory action like it was popular to, to do so in 1980s and 1990s. Unlike this form of research, it is not initiated by Western researchers and development aid workers, but emerged from the need of local population groups themselves to improve their own living conditions and to exercise the knowledge-based critique of the activities of the central government in Bangkok. In this talk, I will present both the emergence and the epistemic practice of Taiwan research and show to what extent it's intersectional, intergenerational, transdisciplinary, 
and communal character might serve as a model for rethinking how we produce scientific knowledge. From the mid 1980s to the early 2000s, Thailand experienced a significant economic growth. A significant factor for this growth was the allocation and utilization of the country's natural resources, especially in waterways. In the process, the interests of the central state were often placed above the needs of populations beyond the urbanized southern coast regions, while the inequality between the rural and urban population of the country grew during the 1990s, the government started an initiative to gain energy independence from neighboring countries. As an essential building block for this pro project was to be the Pak Moon Dam in the northeastern Ubon Rakachami province, which was built and inaugurated in the year 1994. The dam flooded immediately about 117 square kilometers of land and contrary to original predictions by experts, displaced 912 families, of which about 780 lost their agricultural livelihoods. Other social, economic, and environmental consequences emerged in the years that followed its opening, which for many far exceeded the dam's contribution to the country's energy supply. The affected families received rather insufficient reparations from the state. This concerned in particular those who were members of cultural and ethnic minority groups like the So or the Kui. On this slide, you see a member of the Kui community. These groups had been particularly othered by the mainstream society in Thailand and Laos, both by antagonizing and romanticizing them. According to the political and environmental scientists, to meet this governmental neglect led to widespread protests among the rural population of Thailand. The first step was to find ways for and by the rural communities to be heard in the capital. For this purpose, concerned individuals and groups across the country organized themselves in the so-called Assembly of the Poor, a group that aimed to structure and unite the voices of the unheard populations and to demand a voice for them in policy decisions. These efforts included the occupation of the dam by 5,000 villagers, on the 14th of March, 1999, to mark International Rivers Day and the 99-day protest by 20,000 villagers in the capital. Here on the slide, behind me, you see a track of these villagers from one particular region marching together to the capital. The second step of their strategy strategy, so to generate media presence and to bring the concerns of the rural population into the public discourse, to find supporters in the socially progressive circles of the urban groups and the international stage. The third step, closely related to the previous two, was to link the villagers' own concerns was a legitimizing knowledge strategy. While the Thai government referred to expert opinions from universities and research institutions, emphasizing the global development, development benefits of the DAO, the now organized villagers developed an alternative narrative and centered around their cultural perspectives and their experiential knowledge as a people who live with the rivers since countless generations. A central challenge to their endeavor, therefore, 
was translational. How can we, who are oftentimes originally referred to as uneducated water buffaloes, quote, gain politically actionable epistemic authority? In other words, they aim not only to voice their concerns, but to become actionable against the backdrop of justified knowledge. An opportunity for such villager research arose when Taksin Srinivasan, the then popular political leader and prime minister, who particularly relied on the voters of rural regions at the time, agreed to open the dam gates for four months in June 2001. Although this was only intended as an appeasing gesture of goodwill, the activists of the Assembly of the Poor seized their chance and began to outline a research plan for the social and ecological importance of the river. The natural and cultural environment of the river, as well as its various forms of entanglement, should be, according to the activists, explored from the perspective of local people's wisdom their experiences and their traditions. To achieve this goal, the village collective started a collaboration with the Living River Siam project, founded at the peak of the protests in 1999. Given that the Thai government had commissioned classic research institutions to study the ecological impact of the dam, it became clear in the following months that only the collaboration between the local population groups and the Living River Project was capable of meaningfully capturing the connection between the social reality and the ecological situation of living along the river. Their Taiban approach connected narrative approaches towards local fishing traditions, gender roles, the use of plants and herbs, and the functional cycles of the various ecosystems along the river with both epidemiological and ecological data collection. In this context, no form of inquiry should be attributed with more importance over another form of, a form of epistemic perspective. Whether the long-term self-directed observation led by the villagers themselves should generate a new, more localized, but holistic form of valid knowledge. To achieve this, research was organized in a bottom-up manner. The sociologist China Rong Sri Cha Chao characterizes the organization, methodology, and cooperation between villagers, the Living River Project, and its partners in a short reflection from 2004 as follows. The methodology pays specific attention to including all villagers who are interested in engaging the research. Villager researchers are selected by members of their own communities. Research teams are identified and involved in setting up their own terms of reference, including collecting field data, taking samples, and recording information based on their everyday local practices. With support from research assistants, the research findings are analyzed. A local villager and participant in Taiwan research additionally stated, we are the ones who suffer from all negative impacts of the dam. We are the ones who are directly affected. Our lives have been destroyed by the dam. But when fish and nature are restored to the river, our lives are restored too. We are trying to make other people see and understand in the, in the impact of what has happened since the dam gates have been opened. And we thought of documenting the impacts of opening the dam gates by doing our own research. If outsiders conduct the research, we are afraid that they will not see the full picture and will not consider all issues of the impacts from the dam because they are outsiders who live in cities and do not understand our lives. They do not 
do not know about fish, the ecosystem, and the Moon River like we do. Therefore, we decided to do our own research. Control of the research is in such a setting designed to remain in the hands of the villagers. Their perspectival knowledge, or as feminist scholars might say, situated knowledge, must not be suppressed or silenced, but rather brought into the conversation with other forms of knowledge production. This finds a pr practical expression, for example, in the role that the creation and dissemination of topographical representations gained during the Taiwan research. Spatial self-localization is very important for many marginalized ethnic and cultural groups in Southeast Asia. The arbitrary borders that France drew in Southeast Asia during the colonial period, which today is separate today's nation states, in no way represent the originally grown historical and spatial localizations of the people that lived and are still living in these regions. Cultural belonging in Southeast Asia evolved alongside river systems such as the Chao Parai, the Moon, the Mekong, or Salavin and their respective environments. From a political perspective, the opening of the Pak Mundam's sluice gates was connected to a symbolic re-examination of the connection between religious livelihoods, industrial fisheries, and the energy sector. Yet for the Taiwan researchers themselves, it opened the possibility to reconnect with their own collective identity. The river system environment that they might have taken for granted, they now saw to be fragile due to the dam project. The fragility of the river system, therefore, became a reflection for the fragility of their social and cultural identity. To demonstrate the importance of the river, Taiwan researchers began documenting both the return of human life and the restoration of different natural areas in the Moon River water system during August 2001. It was during the inquiry that they chose a geographical form to represent their findings and insights. You see in this picture a group of villagers sketching out a map of their part of the river with its, with its cultural, social, and ecological properties from them. The maps that summarize the activities are highly inclusive with respect to different forms of knowledge. An epistemic hierarchization between local knowledge, narrative accounts, quantified information, or other forms of inquiry is deliberately avoided. This applies both to the range of variation of the maps that emerged from the project and to the information that is summarized in the individual maps. The instrument of the map was chosen in a democratic voting process as an essential epistemic tool of the project because it can be used in an integrative way. As the project's members explain, it is not difficult to draw a map. No special software, GPS, or standard telemetry is needed, even though their use is not excluded. Basically, it would be enough to have a large sheet of paper that could be laid out on the village square of colored chalk, which allows every villager to draw and share her, his, or their knowledge and experiences. The possibilities for participation in this way are extensive. What kind of water streams are there in the area? What trees grow here? Which animals live and live in the observation area? Has their population suffered from the damage? What human settlements are nearby? What farming or fishing techniques are used by yourself and other locals? What have you measured in the water if you use such specialized methods, for example, the concentration of microorganisms? Maps serve in this context as boundary objects, which are equally accessible for all involved actors. The sociological concept of boundary object was introduced by Susan Starr and James Biesema. It refers to 
objects that are used and interpreted in different ways by different people that can acquire different meanings in different social worlds, but which are at the same time stable, accessible, and open enough for a wide variety of actors to participate in their production and different forms of use. Even more elaborate maps were later used in negotiations with the Thai government and its appointed experts uh, and its uh, appointed experts. They no, do not hide the contribution of the village communities to the uh, generation of knowledge about life in the Thai river system, but rather integrate the knowledge expressed in their respective maps. An example of this, of this uh, example of this ecosystem map of the Mekong Basin area of Chai Xi'an and Chai Kong, as well as Vian Kian, districts of the Chiang Rai province presented in the final government audit of 2002, shows on different levels, different forms of knowledge, but quality is not very well in this slide. So although this map may appear to be a standard GPS representation of the river vessel, in reality, it represents various other forms of knowledge that directly stem from the collaborative approach of the villages. It highlights, for example, detailed information about 438 indigenous ecosystems based on local knowledge, the places where local people fish, which ethnic groups use which ecosystems for their livelihoods, the histories associated with the places in which parts of the river coast have been affected by the dam construction. The map also shows that some of the local groups characterized by the government as forest destroyers actually contribute to the conversation of local ecosystems in a specific rhythm of deforestation and reforestation. When the screening committee, headed by the deputy prime minister Kavali Yong Chiandu, met in January 2002 to review the results of the Park Moon Dam research, Taiban research had become a media sensation in Thailand. Never before had Thai villagers conducted their own research to influence national policy decisions regarding the country's resources. At the same time, some of the authors of one of the official research reports took an oppositional position towards the validity and reliability of research conducted by the project. In the eyes of these experts, Thai Ban's integrative approach would not be very meaningful and would elude scientific knowledge with individual opinions. Despite such criticisms, the screening committee decided to make the summary of the Taiban research, one of the four sources for its decision-making process regarding the future of the dam. Although the screening committees considered a study by the Ubun Rakan Chai University to be the most meaningful, the knowledge of the Taiban report co-produced by local communities was also taken seriously by the assembled decision-makers because the studies of the lay researchers and their specific experiential expertise were shown to complement the university report in many ways. Together, they painted a cohesive picture of the convergence of indigenous lifestyles and agricultural practices, as well as the ecological richness of the country's riverine regions. On this basis, the audit panel decided to advise the prime minister of the country that the dam gate should remain open for most of the year. This should allow local communities to maintain their culture while preserving the identity and ecological richness of Thailand's river plus. The audit's advice was celebrated as a big win by the Thai Ban research, as well as the social movement of the assembly of the poor. Prime Minister Shina Manka, who was under fire from the country's economic and royal elites at the time, found himself thus in a dilemma over this advice. In order to maintain his political influence, he had to reach a compromise, even though he had originally supported the villagers' concerns through the media. According to Jun Mint, 
the Prime Minister met on December 20th, 2002 with 30 representatives of the villages and the university's research team. This encounter was even broadcast live on major television channels and accompanied by documentaries about Taiwan activities and the lives of the population groups living in the region of the Moon River. Shinavatra even agreed to visit some of the villages personally and then to make an appropriate decision. In the coming weeks, nonetheless, the prime minister commissioned in an ad hoc manner further studies on the situation. This time, however, no research institutions or local stakeholders were involved, but the Second Army, the Border Police, and the National Bureau of Statistics. Based on their new reports, as well as the consensus of the university and Taiwan reports, it was finally decided on the 14th of January to keep the gates of the dam open for four months each year. Although the final decision by the Thai government was ultimately rather disappointing for the indigenous people of the River Basin, from a meta perspective, it can also be seen as a success. Never before had the knowledge of the rural poor been taken so seriously as a decision-making factor in Thai society. The example of activism against the Moon River Dam has changed, uh, changed this. Implicit local and experiential knowledge was valorized nationwide, and the spatial methods of lake cartographic research even became an intellectual import in the years to come, used in Vietnam and China, among other places. Such epistemic strategies give underrepresented groups the opportunity to draw attention to their own concerns in a language that can be easily translated into scientific and political discourse. This creates a form of empowerment of marginalized populations based on a certain epistemic authority of living there and having the everyday knowledge of the place. At the same time, the Thai Bad research also shows that a problem-centered collection and dissemination of local knowledge can have an identity creating or identity affirming function. The bottom up organized villager, villager research ultimately transformed marginalized groups into actors with a certain socio political influence. At the same time, it reinforced the sense of belonging, in this case, less oriented towards the Thai nation state, but rather as members of a culture of cultural groups who see the country's river system as their habitat and want to preserve thus their ecology. For them, it is not state borders that create identity, but the branched complex and variable structures of the waterways. This, I believe, is the unique power of collective generated knowledge that is based on experiences. It focuses on the needs of real people and is oriented towards finding solutions for their problems. Epistemic ingenuity and use of the knowledge it produces may be understood from the, this perspective as something of an anthropological constant. Herein, the Thai Bar research approach resembles social health movements of the 1970s, the forms of engagement, knowledge production, and the religious protests are very similar to the ways in which for example, poor Americans exercise their own agency in the case of toxic waste dumps in Woburn, Massachusetts during the 1970s. In 1972, a resident of Woburn, whose son was just diagnosed with acute leukemia, suspected that the cause lay in water contamination by nearby factories. She began collecting evidence from other residents, often women, and with the help of a pastor, had organized the community. Although the State Department in charge of water quality was aware of toxic levels in the river since, the late, 19, since late 1972, the 
information did not reach the public. In 1979, a ch chance uh, discovery of almost 200 chemical barrels containing an unknown substance along the river and close to two wells where drinking water was pumped confirmed the public's suspicion about water quality, which tasted and smelled bad. In the following years, residents engaged in what the historian of science, Phil Brown, calls popular epidemiology collecting and analyzing experiential data about resident health and its possible connection to water contamination. Popular epidemiology is not just classical epidemiology performed with the help of lay people. It broadens the spectrum of causative agents, including social factors, and challenges traditional assumptions about risk analysis, such as those response relationships. Yet, in the case studied by Brown, lay people work together with professional epidemiologists, uniting lay and professional perspectives in an effort to link science and politics. Together, they identified a cluster of leukemia that could be linked to the contaminate, contaminated water by conducting interviews of residents about pregnancies and child disorders, for example. The resident study, eventually supported by Harvard Public Health and epidemiology experts, formed the evidential basis for the litigation against the two companies that had leaked toxic waste in the water in the region. But the resident's opposition was also directed towards state scientists who ignored, minimized, or omitted evidence of contamination. Physicians also offered limited support to residents at least in the early history of toxic waste mobilization, because they tended to explain away the occurrence of diseases through biological and not environmental causes. This only reinforced the community's attempt to rely on their own experiential knowledge rather than on state experts. As Brown noted, residents begin to distrust traditional scientific authorities when those authorities contradict the experiential knowledge that the community has gathered and developed. Although the outcome of the trial was only a modest victory for the plaintiffs, it had established a model discussed in the media nationwide during the 1970s and early 1980s of how residents could produce scientific knowledge about their health and environment. As Brown put it, I quote, the popular epidemiological approach to toxic waste contamination in Bogron and other toxic waste sites gives much more credibility and power to the lay public than does the governmental version of public participation. Both the example of the resistance towards the pan munda and popular epidemiology in Bobon emphasize, in my eyes, the timeless character of local experiential knowledge as a form of epistemic counter expertise. So thank you for your interest. I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion. You can also find the stories that I just told in more detail among other case studies in my recently published book, uh, The Knowledge of Experience. Many of the translations from Thai to English have been provided by my daughter, Letizia Siritalia. Yeah, with, without her, I have to say, I would not have been able to dig this deep into the topic and case study. So even for the narrative approaches and to go through the provided interviews from the Taiwan research. I hope I gave you uh, an insight in how I think experiential knowledge is, can be used to explain the rise of participatory forms of knowledge production towards today. And I'm very excited to discuss the topic with you. Thank you.